Uh, thank you, Alex. If you can see in the chat, uh, you know that we will have. Uh, you can ask questions in the Q and A section of Zoom. Uh, I lead a small team here at the Wikimedia Foundation uh, that focuses on protecting uh, volunteers uh, who are persecuted for their good faith participation uh, for their good faith participation in Wikimedia projects. So we're a small team, and we also work with many teams across the foundation and external partners on human rights issues. That said, and we have a lovely hello slide with many languages here, uh, and we'll go ahead and get started with the presentation so that then we can have our speakers, who we're all here to hear, uh, get started. Uh, next slide, please. So welcome to Wiki for Human Rights 2024, Knowledge for a Sustainable Future. Uh, this is focusing on the right to benefit from science and an expert webinar with some excellent guests. Uh, very knowledgeable guests that I think will be, will be quite interesting. This is one of the, uh, you know, human rights that we don't really talk about very much, right? There's a lot of focus on freedom of expression. There's a lot of focus on um, you know, privacy, especially with an online platform, you know, but, but more to being a human, you know, online than just these two rights. And one of the rights that we do have, you know, is the right to benefit from science, right? That's not just going to be hoarded and held by a select group of individuals, right? That all people have a right to benefit from scientific progress. And a platform like Wiki Wikipedia, you know, which anybody can contribute to, it's global, you know, and is one of the ways that people find out about new scientific discoveries. I've, I'm, I've certainly Googled something I'm curious about and I go to Wikipedia and then I read about, oh my goodness, they discovered this in 2023. Um, so this is one of the ways in which people around the world, you know, discover you know, new scientific discoveries, and then also, and then also, you know, ask, am I benefiting from this? Next slide, please. So we all have an opportunity, you know, many of us all follow scientific news. I used to do a lot of amateur astrophotography for many years, and I, you know, would really regularly read all the latest, you know, astronomical, almost an astrological, but astronomical news, um, and keeping up to date on what was going on in the astronomy community for many, many years. I still do read. I don't participate as much as I used to, uh, but it was something that was really, you know, meaningful to me. It some, is something that's meaningful to me. Uh, and it's something, it's an opportunity, you know, those of us who are passionate about different topics and subjects that are out there, uh, for us to actually, you know, support others in benefiting from this right by sharing our knowledge, you know, on Wikimedia platforms. This is one of the, you know, for every right, there's a corresponding responsibility. And I believe that those of us who are passionate about these subjects or aware of these subjects related to science, you know, we should be sharing what we know with, you know, online, especially in platforms that are focused on the educational content and informing the public, like Wikimedia projects. This is part of a partnership, of course, with the Wikimedia Foundation uh, and UN Human Rights. And of course, today we're going to have speakers from the UN Environment. So this is a great partnership uh, specifically focused on our platform. Next slide, please. So ultimately, you know, the right to benefit from, from science, you know, is a story very much about future generations and our future collectively. You know, if we cannot, you know, science can do many wonderful things that can really benefit, you know, our, our lives tremendously. Uh, I'm part of that generation who can clearly remember life before the internet, you know, and, you know, all the research that was done by researchers that where I did my PhD at UCLA, which one of the, you know, founding universities of the internet you know, all the research that was done, you know, on, you know, internet protocol, et cetera, you know, has really benefited my life and, and for many others and so many other young people, you know, as I've also been a professor for many years, you know, teaching them about the, how the internet works. For example, I used to also teach on hard science. I used to teach on physical geography. So climate change and earthquakes and, you know, and seeing people you know, light up and then really understand how sensitive and delicate, you know, the how sensitive and delicate natural ecosystems are, and you know what a position of power humans are in, you know, to really impact these systems it was really, you know, a very satisfying moment for people to realize, uh, you know, that first of all how the world works, you know, how these natural ecosystems work, and second of all what a responsibility that they have. So this is also not only just a story about a technological platform or in you know, how we share knowledge, but also, you know future, our future and future generations and how they use the knowledge that we choose to share. Next slide, please. Wonderful, so quite briefly, um, we will just talk about Wikimedia and human rights commitments. Uh, I'm hoping that uh, one of my team can share the link to the Wikimedia Human Rights Policy. I will, sh I can share it quite quickly too. I have it ready to go for everybody here. Uh, this is the this is the link to the Human Rights Policy. 
everybody should be able to see that in the chat. Um, quite briefly, uh, you know, the human rights policy commits us to protect, respect, and uphold the rights of users within our ecosystem on Wikimedia projects. And the human rights team in particular, you know, works to advance the realization of rights. We are really uniquely positioned to support, you know, especially, you know, access to information, you know, freedom of expression, the right to assembly, you know, people coming together. Um, and we also support, you know, communities, that, members who are at risk and groups uh, who are at risk for their contributions to be based on their good faith contributions to Wikimedia projects. We're a small team. Uh, and, you know, the Wikimedia Foundation itself, given the size of the platform, is a small organization, but we work with lots of like-minded organizations around the world, coalitions, individual groups, um, to support broad causes related to human rights and to support our volunteers as much as possible. And to also ensure that we're, you know, connected less from a top-down perspective, you know, but more with organizations that are closer to our communities rather than further away from our communities and who are familiar with the culture, language, customs, you know, of are immensely diverse, uh, you know, volunteers around the world. Next slide, please. And you, you know, Wikimedia's mission. This is the, the right to access the benefits of science. Is you know, core. You know, you know, really links into a core part of Wikimedia's mission. With you know, ensuring that people have the you know the ability to contribute to scientific edu to educational resources on the internet. So, uh, this is really a natural fit, and I'm really also glad that the foundation you know, and volunteers have been interested in exploring other human rights and how Wikimedia intersects with them. I really believe that this is a, you know, as also a human rights scholar, I really believe that this is an important, uh, you know, thing that we need to start looking at other rights, uh, you know, and how online platforms intersect with them. So I really commend everybody, the attendees, and of course, the foundation and UN Human Rights for being open to these kind of collaborations. Next slide, please. Yes, we can skip that slide. Obviously, you're here at this event. So a couple quick examples before we get on to our speakers, you know, of how some communities around the world are engaging with this, uh, this right. The Igbo community, you know, focus on translating important concepts about local and global poverty uh, to Igbo from English to put the, the SDGs one and two in context, right? These are important ways that this information gets disseminated out there rather than centralized and gets you know, more decentralized into local languages and small languages, big languages to benefit, you know, our planet ultimately. Next slide, please. If you haven't seen this video, this is a great one. If, you, if you're a Spanish speaker, uh, can, hopefully we can share the link uh, in the chat. Uh, but it's a video that put together uh, by Wikimedia Bolivia with Timmy Capibara right there, this little, uh, little Capibara, you know, on the, the importance of a sustainable future and Wikipedia's role in that. It's really entertaining. It's what, what entertaining. Well done. I encourage Spanish speakers uh, to watch this. Uh, next slide, please. And we, hopefully somebody can share the link in there because they can't actually copy that on the slide. Apologies, I did not have that ready to go. And it's not these, these just these communities. Um, you know, as you can see here, we have people, you know, we have French speakers, you know, we have Spanish speakers, we have, you know, Arabic language community who are all holding events, you know, within their communities around sustainability, around the environment, about the right to access science. You know, as it intersects with, with the Wikimedia platform. So what we're talking about here isn't just a sort of a one-off thing that's coming from you know, the foundation and it's more of a top-down approach, but this is something that's actually being you know, engaged with, you know, with communities. There have been over 15 events in Spanish this year alone. Um, and you know, French in Cameroon here, we have, we have the Ghana community, uh, we have Uruguay, that poster is from Uruguay actually. You know, so this is something that's happening around all, you know, Wikimedia projects and is a quite a broad movement in general. So we're really happy to be part of that and really appreciate that community members have started this conversation so that we can continue to move it forward with them. Next slide, please. So how can you get involved? Uh, pretty easy, of course, obviously editing on topics related to, you know, science um, and ensuring and holding events like that have been done. Easier said than done. Of course, the foundation is always here to support these kind of initiatives. Uh, but we can go on to the next slide to discuss at least one quick way here, which, you know, is to check the community events. There's a, you can join an event related to this topic or, of course, other, you know, really great events that are related to Wikimedia projects. I, you know, was not so familiar with the Wikimedia community when I started three and a half years ago. I was an avid user of it, Wikipedia, but then discovering how much goes on and how much community members do has been really inspiring to me, you know, really uh, wonderful. So I really encourage all of you to 
you know, take a look at some of these community events. There's a link right there. Hopefully uh, we can get that shared. There it is. It is shared in the chat for you uh, to join in. With that brief introduction, um, I will now turn this over to Mohammed Amin Ben Lulu, who is a Wikimedia community member in the Maghreb region, who will speak about perspectives from the Wikimedia community, importance of, of the Wiki for Human Rights campaign. And now, Mohammed, I will turn it over to you. I am not sure if Mohammed is here. Yes, we will move forward with Raphael then. Apologies. Uh, Raphael Pangalangan, uh, who's at the UN Human Rights, who will speak on the right to benefit from science. And Raphael, apologies if I did not pronounce your name correctly. As a, as a fellow person who suffers from that, please accept my apologies if that was not correct. Um, the right to benefit from science, R2HE, and the transitional justice framework. Raphael, over to you. Looking forward to your talk. Yes, thanks so much, uh, Cameron. And um, uh, right on the uh, right on point with the pronunciation, um, which is um, a, a rare occasion. So it's much 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 appreciated. Um, so thank you so much, first of all, uh, to our colleagues here for this opportunity to. Um, present on the specific uh, topic, the intersections, the role of science vis-a-vis uh, -vis the transitional justice framework, um, the environment and climate change team, of which um, I am a uh, member, stands ready to continuing um, supporting similar um, similar projects uh, such as such as this. Now it's quite interesting because. Um, from Cameron's presentation, uh, there, there was one, one slide that uh, jumped off the page for me, which was one that um, I, I believe it said um, how this is a story about the, the future, how a story about the future and future generations. And this lies at the heart of our work uh, here at the OHCHR. But while this is indeed perspective, in the sense that um, the right to benefit from science has its role moving forward. At the same time, I would add that it has a role in looking into the past as, as well. And this is where the mandate that I, which I support uh, comes, comes to the fore. The, the project that I support here at the office is on the nuclear legacy in the Marshall Islands and its environmental impacts, the impacts of nuclear radiation uh, on the uh, full realization of, of, human, of human rights. And oftentimes what we see is how the right to information and the right to benefit from, um, from science is seen in prospective terms, but not necessarily in terms of giving justice for past violations. And I think that that is an incredibly um, uh, interesting opportunity to explore with colleagues in this discussion, because information and access to science, in this, particularly in this context, is not solely to inform policy to define law, but can also be conceived as means in and of itself of giving justice. The traditional conception of justice, as let's say depicted by the, the Hollywood conception of justice would be in the courtroom, would be through prosecutions. But what the transitional justice framework shows is that justice takes many a shape and form. And part of that is justice through truth. And when we speak of truth, this isn't limited to historical truths, but likewise scientific truths, scientific assessments of previous impacts of ongoing challenges and barriers. And the right to benefit from science, therefore, um, would be both re retrospective and prospective um, in, in, in utility. When we, uh, one other aspect that I hope to highlight, and I'll be uh, speaking uh, very, very briefly here, is how when we speak of benefiting from science, one aspect that we emphasize 
um, in, in, our, in our work is that this isn't solely conceived in terms of receiving information, but it's also about participating in that process. And um, I, was, I was very happy to see, in fact, uh, Cameron's uh, invitation to uh, engage with um, the, uh, the Wiki, Wikimedia um, uh, events. And I think this is something that we would look at quite closely for the purposes of the nuclear legacy as well. So when we speak of the right to benefit from science, this equally means, this equally contemplates the right to participate uh, therein. And why this is of utmost importance in this context is when we are speaking of victims, when, when we are thinking, speaking of marginalized groups, more often than not, it is easily they are easily conceived as just that, victims, as marginalized groups. But in truth, they are likewise active agents of participation, active um, agents of resilience, and therefore are not only the recipients of information, but contributors there, there too as well. And this is, this is something that I think um, the work of uh, the Wikimedia Foundation aligns quite close, uh, 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 quite nicely with the work that we do. In making that conversation, that dialogue, that two-way discourse and more um, accessible, the mandate that I support refers to nuclear impacts, and this may be quite intimidating of a topic given its technicalities, its scientific, um, legal, uh, its scientific uh, lexicon. So equally, when we speak of the right to benefit from science, what we contemplate is not only providing that information, but ensuring accessibility of that information, maybe in the way that it is presented, in the way that it is translated and made accessible to stakeholders from around um, from around the world so to, to wrap up and uh, all, all this to say um, thank you thank you so much first of all to the uh, Wik Wikimedia uh, Foundation for providing this platform for us to speak briefly on our work and to, to emphasize that the right to benefit from science is likewise a, a means of providing justice in, in its own right. So um, thank you very much and uh, happy to provide any clarifications and answer any questions, should there be any down the, uh, down the road. Thanks. Well, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, that was excellent. And wow, I mean, already we're off to a really good start with these thoughtful you know, interventions by our uh, attendees. Uh, so thank you so much, Raphael. And if you do have questions, please, you can feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, we will have time uh, for Q&A at the very end. Um, and be sure to put the question in now, because if you're like me, you'll have a great question and then you'll listen to the next speaker and forget it. So if you have a great question, I encourage you know, my brief interruption here to be an opportunity for you to put that question into the chat. Um, unfortunately, I was informed that Mohammed is having some technical issues, but we do have some good news because there, he did pre-record a video for us that we'll stream for you. And I will turn that over to my uh, my colleague here. We'll actually start that for us. Sandra will start that um, that we can watch. Again, I know Mohammed sends his apologies that he couldn't be here in person. There were some technical issues that showed up, uh, but he was ahead of the curve uh, by as a, as a true Wikimedian by being prepared here and recording a video for us to watch. So now we will watch Mohammed's uh, video right here. Andy Belulu, I'm the coordinator of Wiki for Climate Change in the Maghreb region, which is a part of uh, Wiki for Human Rights Global Campaign. I would like to thank the organizers for having this opportunity to share with you uh, how we use Wikimedia project to highlight uh, climate change in the Maghreb uh, region. So the Maghreb region, its rich history, diverse uh, ethnicity, language uh, faces significant uh, environmental challenges due to climate change, like uh, desertification, art road, and those challenges uh, are motivated, uh, motivated, uh, motivated, uh, motivated us 
uh, as a Wikimedian in the Maghreb region to work together and collaborate and how to find solution for those challenges, those challenges through uh, Wikimedia, uh, Wikimedia, pro Wikimedia projects. Uh, one of the main objectives is make sure that everyone has access to uh, scientific uh, information and that by encouraging uh, contributors and new users in Wikipedia project in highlighting uh, climate change issue and promoting also knowledge for sustainable future on Wikimedia uh, projects. And we do that through uh, uh, creating several events and activities such as like workshops, do some training for you so the beginners how to create an article, how to trace an article, how to add uh, a reference to an article, as example, uh, how to upload the pictures. Also, uh, we organize uh, editor contest. Create also uh, creating uh, articles, translate them uh, to different uh, languages. Also, we organize conferences and webinars we, where we uh, collaborate with scientists, uh, academic research, and also artists to, to show their uh, to show their successful uh, project and idea, which has related work for for climate change in the in the Maghreb region. Also, the campaign uh, supporting the emergence of uh, the Wikimedia Libya user group. Uh, the campaign, the first edition of the campaign uh, last year, it was a great chance and great opportunity for uh, Wikimedia in Libya to gather in together and uh, contribute and participate. It was a great opportunity, uh, high the energy from them, they organized several conferences, uh, also contests. Uh, for the first time after 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 while stop and not contribute together uh in in Wikimedia project and something we we really happy to 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 share and really they they did a great a great great job also we promoting activities related uh the environment among law represented language groups such such as uh uh the native language of uh, North Africa, also Tashinhait, uh, Tashawit, Moroccan Darja, and uh, and and Kabi. So there was some statistic of uh, the campaign uh, last year. Uh, we organized 11, uh, 11 events in, in 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 online in person. Uh, great rate and high energy from all the participants and the organizers. They really motivated many, many people. And then we also invite new people to, to involve and be, uh, and make a good impact uh, through Wikimedia, Wikimedia projects. Also, we applaud uh, more than 150 pictures on Wikimedia Commons. Also, we create more than 500 uh, articles in different Wikipedia, such as Arabic, uh, French, and, uh, and, and Darja. That's really, really great uh, work and effort by volunteers and who work together to collaborate to, uh, to also uh, collaborate to find a solution for environmental challenges. And we believe that uh, Wikimedia projects uh, give us space uh, where we can uh, share information based in a scientific fact. Also, uh, find a solution in technology to Wikimedia project. And all that uh, by uh, working together and collaborating with members from Wikimedia, uh, scientists, uh, uh, climate change actors, uh, indigenous people. So together uh, we work uh, to find a solution 
uh, and at least increase uh, uh, climate change uh, effects. And uh, thank you so much for your attention. Uh, please, Tenet Mirt, uh, please, uh, secure code. If you want to know more about uh, the campaign, uh, you can scan a QR code and take a look in our meeting page. Thank you for the attention again. Bye. Well, even though Mohammed's not here, thank you, Mohammed, very much for that uh, excellent, excellent presentation, and also how inspiring it is, at least for me, again, to see you know what the community is doing, the grassroots efforts that are out there, you know, on this important topic. So really well done, and I do hope you know if you do need access to that video again, if there's something you missed, because unfortunately you will not be able to ask questions, you know, please let us know. We can uh, find a way to get a streaming link to you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. Uh, again, if you do have any questions, please put them in the chat. Now we will move over to our panelists, and uh, I will give a brief introduction to them, and and then I will ask them to give I will give their names and ask them to give a brief introduction about themselves, and then we have some guiding questions for them, and hopefully we'll have a, a stimulating and interesting discussion. First, we have Eliza Morgera, and again, please forgive me if I am mispronouncing your name. Who is a UN Special Rapporteur on Climate Change, Lisa Kerpo. Koper Kualak, hopefully I pronounced that correctly again, ICC Canada President, and Martha Stokes, the Assessment Specialist uh, in the Global Assessments Unit at UNEP. So we have some very prestigious panelists here. I'm so excited to hear what you all have to say. And I'd like you all to just give a brief introduction, and then I will start with a guiding question. So we'll start with Aliza first as we go through, as I go through my list here. Aliza, over to you. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for the invitation to join this really interesting um, conversation. Uh, my name is Elisa Morgera, so close enough. Um, so I've become UN Special Rapporteur on Climate Change and Human Rights on the 1st of May, so quite early days still. Um, and I'm actually already working on two thematic reports. One is due on Monday, and the next one, which is very relevant for our conversation, is due in mid-July, and it's about access to information on climate change and human rights. Um, so very important connections with the conversation today. Uh, my background is inter international environmental law and human rights. I've worked with the UN before uh, in the Eastern Caribbean and also with the Food and Agriculture Organization in different regions, uh, supporting governments in revising national legislation on natural resources. And then I've become an academic. I'm a professor at Strathclyde University in Glasgow, Scotland, um, where I've been working more and more in collaboration, both with the UN but also with researchers and communities in really understanding how the co-production of knowledge um, is really essential to co-develop effective and fair solutions to climate change and other environmental challenges. So I'll stop there for now. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, and I will turn it over to Lisa now for their introduction. Hello and good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are today. Yes, I'm uh, Lisa Koper Kualuk, and um, I'm president of Inuit Circumpolar Council of Canada, which makes me the vice chair of Inuit Circumpolar Council. And Inuit Circumpolar Council represents over 180,000 Inuit living in four different countries. So in Chukotka, Russia, in Alaska, in the United States, in Canada, and in Greenland. And as a people of the Arctic, um, we have lived through uh, many, many decades of colonization. And so environmental warming, for example, due to climate change, is at a rate more than four times faster than the rest of the planet, impacting our culture, our health, and our well being. And so we are disproportionately impacted by contaminants such as mercury and persistent organic pollutants traveling long distances to the Arctic and accumulating in our environment. And so that poses health risks to our communities, our people who live in the Arctic. Now, while science is important, it's our right to access science and make it available for decision-making. 
So I'd like to bring your attention to our view, the indigenous view on science and knowing. Now, because science has a particular history, itself has been a part of colonization. So our knowledge had not been treated equally and that's had consequences within our communities as well. And so um, when we talk about knowledge, we talk about prioritizing our research issues and participating in research in an equitable and um, engaged manner. So I'm talking about indigenous self-determination in research and monitoring activities in our homelands. So ICC has developed these protocols in the last few years that we call circumpolar Inuit protocols on ethical and equitable engagement. These protocols describe how we need to be engaged in the Arctic when it comes to research activities in our homeland that we call Inuit Nunat. And these protocols are easily found on our website. If you Google circumpolar Inuit protocols, that'll bring you directly to the link where you can find them. And they are very useful as guides to decision makers, to researchers, to policy makers, to funders as well, on how to engage in an equitable manner with us. Now, um, there are also other materials that we've created, um, such as a video uh, guided both by indigenous knowledge and science. So we're not against science or Western science, but what we are for and what we are saying is that it requires the best available knowledge, not only just science, we also consider our own knowledge as indigenous science. So if we talk about science, science is inclusive of all knowledges as well. So when we work at the Arctic Council, for example, we want to co-produce knowledge. We want to design uh, research projects as well. So there's lots of work that we are doing um, including in sustainable shipping, also uh, the climate change. And I hope that um, among you listeners that we'll also have some opportunity to, to collaborate and work with best available knowledge when we can. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa, for your intervention. And it's good to have you here. Thank you. And last but not least, we will have an introduction from Martha Stokes before we begin the conversation. And uh, Martha is with UNEP. Uh, over to you. Hi, everybody. Thank you. Um, it's really nice to be here today. Um, hopefully you can hear me. I don't know if I've just frozen, actually. I'm dialing in from Nairobi. Let me just give this a minute. I can hear you, Martha. Okay, great. I think we've had some internet connectivity issues in the last couple of hours. Um, so yes, yeah, so my name is Martha Stokes. I'm originally from Scotland, so it was nice to hear from um from Elisa that she's working over in Strathclyde. Um, I'm now based in Nairobi at the UNEP headquarters, uh, and specifically the project that I'm working on is with the Global Environment Outlook uh, report. Sorry, there's a little bit of background noise going on. Um, so the Global Environment Outlook report also known as the GEO, is UNEP's flagship report. Um, it's, it's a very big process to produce it. It gets produced every several years. The last one, GEO 6, was produced in 2019. And the GEO 7 report, so the seventh edition that we're working on now, is expected to be released at the end of 2025. Um, so a few points I just wanted to explain a bit about the GEO. Um, I think that 
traditionally in the past, what the GEO has done is assess all of the different um, ecosystems um, from around the world and provide an update to to member states, um, so to, to governments, but also to um, educational facilities, to policymakers, to, to a very wide range of audiences. Um, about what the state and trends are in those ecosystems. So we'd look at air, what's going on with that. We'd look at land and soils, oceans and coasts, also freshwater. Um, and we're also doing that in the seventh edition of GEO. But what we're also doing um, is is looking more at, um, at solutions. So we're a much more solutions focused um, edition this time. And what we're also doing to um, put together solutions to not just what the problems are with the environment, but what we can be doing about them is we are drawing on a, a much wider range of, of knowledge and of different knowledges. Um, so it was really interesting just to hear from Lisa just now um, about um, Indigenous knowledge, Indigenous science. So one of the things that we've done this year is um, we've created um, an Indigenous knowledge and local knowledge task force. And there's actually a dialogue log going on right now between some of my uh, teammates as well um, and Indigenous knowledge holders um, in Mexico um, so that we can be making sure that we are gathering this knowledge and being able to integrate it in an appropriate way into the um, into the GEO 7 report. Um, we also have another task group called the Behavioural, Social and Cultural Task Group. Um, and one of the things that that task group is doing, um, amongst other things, it's looking at how to bring more social sciences, more behavioural sciences, and also how we can include a discussion of human rights um, in this GEO um, edition. So we actually spoke to some colleagues from OHCHR a couple of months ago, and they sent us a list of some of the, the human rights that we might want to consider in our report. Um, so we're working across all of our 21 chapters to figure out how to, um, how to integrate them. Um, so there's yeah there's lots going on at Geo. Um, I'll post a link into the chat to our website if you're interested to hear more. There's a there's a link at the bottom where you can sign up to the newsletter, um, and I'll post some links to the um, Indigenous Knowledge and Local Knowledge Task Force and also the Behavioural, Social and Cultural Task Group. Um, I think I can stop there. Hopefully that was a it's a brief overview. There's lots to learn about Geo. Um, but yes, thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to some of the questions from everyone. Wonderful. Thank you, Martha. Thank you to all of our panelists for the thoughtful introductions. It's really a privilege to have you here. I'm very excited. Uh, with that, one another reminder again that you please put your questions into the chat. Um, that way it will come up in the Q&A section that, so that we can address the questions a little bit later. So just a reminder. Um, and thank you, Martha, for posting the link there. I'm a big fan of interdisciplinarity um, myself academically, so I'm glad to hear that that's happening. So now on to the guided questions. The first question that we have here, and um, the way the structure of this will work, is I will call, I will call on Aliza as the first person, uh, as the first person on my list. This time, each each question I will, I will lead with a different a panelist, um, and who will give a response, and then the pan, the other panelists are invited to respond. And of course, again, you know, uh, attendees are invited to submit questions again via the chat. So the first question that we have here is: What are the main barriers to the effective enjoyment of the rights to a healthy environment and science. Now, barriers here, I would consider, you know, political barriers, economic barriers, social barriers, institutional barriers, you know, it, that means bureaucratic barriers, cultural barriers, et cetera. Um, I think a, a broad discussion of these kind of barriers and, you know, how these are, you know, impacting things, uh, it would be worthwhile. So, Elisa, over to you. Thank you so much. I mean, there could be many answers to your question, but maybe what, what I'm picking to um, focus on is the idea that all sectors in society and in the economics can contribute to um, mitigate climate change and contribute to adaptation. And so I think one of the barriers is really making sure that all sectors are indeed engaged and also share the information so that all of us can have a sense of when um, what we understand that climate change is negatively impacting or has a risk of negatively impacting human rights, uh, including everyone's human rights to life, to health, uh, livelihoods and culture, but also uh, children's rights, indigenous people's rights, the rights of persons with disabilities. Um, and that means that, you know, going back to our, to our particular focus, uh, making sure that we bring together that information from across different sectors and sciences and, and areas of knowledge is essential so that all of us can be really aware 
fully of how climate change may be impacting our human rights. And so I'm thinking, you know, that point that also Martha made around the importance of including not only natural sciences, and some natural sciences are more dominant than others in climate change. I'm thinking about, you know, meteorology, for instance, or physical sciences, but we know that biodiversity sciences have a lot to add to our understanding of the global climate system as part of the earth system, uh, but equally social sciences and arts as um, sciences that help us connect and have that, I think, respectful um, and learning with indigenous knowledge and other knowledge holders. Um, and I'm thinking particularly, you know, about also the health sector, medical evidence, uh, providing disaggregated data so that we can understand who uh, in society is most likely to be affected or most likely to be affected for the longest time um, in the context of climate change. So I would say that that effort of breaking silos and finding ways to connect, but also to mutually understand and maybe challenge each other in a constructive way where we see the different areas of knowledge and efforts to share and produce knowledge around how climate change is affecting us, but also how action or inaction on climate change may be uh, posing risks to our human rights um, is really essential. And, and it is a barrier at the moment, uh, not to mention, I think, important questions uh, that have already been alluded to related to how accessible that information is and to whom, and are there historical or colonial legacies in how that information and knowledge has been produced that contributes to um, discriminatory uh, impacts uh, in terms of understanding and, and limited protection of human rights. Thank you so much for that very thoughtful and comprehensive answer. I uh, really appreciate it. There's a, there's a lot to get into here, but I'll turn it over to Lisa. Yes, thank you. I so agree with Elisa. Um, whose remarks make so much sense to us as, as an Indigenous people who push for, um, you know, taking into account human rights and, and the necessity of taking human rights approach when it comes to treaties and also including Indigenous peoples in this whole decision-making process. And what I'd like to point out is that instead of talking about science only, as I mentioned earlier, let's talk about the best available science, which should always be used. So in our experience, the barriers to effective enjoyment of our rights are, it always comes down to economic interests. The contamination due to plastics, for example, and other contaminants is impacting our human right to live a healthy life and the protection of the environment. So our rights are outlined in several documents, such as the UN General Assembly Resolution in July 2022, the Rio Principles, as well as the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. However, while these rights have been acknowledged by many countries, they continue also to be violated by others. So um, this year, the Special Rapporteur on the Implications of Human Rights um, of the in Environmentally Sound Management and Disposal of Hazardous Substances and Wastes, and also the Special Rapporteur on the Human Right to a Clean, Healthy and Sustainable Environment published a paper outlining how the whole life cycle of plastics has become a global threat to human rights. So we agree with many of their comments on the importance to add a human rights perspective to the preamble and operative text of the treaty. We would also like to point out, however, that the importance of recognizing indigenous knowledge in an equal way to science in the treaty. So we have that right to our knowledge to be recognized and utilized alongside science. So any treaty should be built on human rights, but specifically pay attention to the rights of indigenous peoples as we are regularly marginalized 
and our rights are often violated. In any case, we're living with impact of pollution and the human rights violations every day, but we have knowledge that can contribute to the solutions. So a human rights-based approach is needed to ensure that this doesn't continue, because at a certain point, we have to look past how the impacts industry and economy have had and look at how it is impacting our interconnected ecosystem. So this is what needs to be put first. Thank you. Well, well said and very heartfelt, Lisa. Thank you so much for that. I could not agree more. Uh, really touched me. Um, but enough about my reaction here. Thank you again, Lisa and Eliza for your, your interventions. Now we'll turn it over to Martha to answer the question. Martha, over to you. Thank you very much. I think there's been so many good points that have already been made. I'll just add a couple of more. Um, but before I do, I'm going to post into the chat another link um, that is from a resource that I really, really like. Some of you might have heard of it. It's called the Environmental Justice Atlas. Um, so of course the concept of environmental justice is very related to human rights um, and on this uh, on this link you can actually see a map of the world and loads of different cases where um, some sort of project um, to do with maybe natural resources um, has happened um, and you can see what that has meant for different communities whether that has infringed upon human rights and also sometimes in some cases what people have done about that to make sure that human rights are upheld so um, I really like that I really encourage everybody to take a look um, I think from a geo perspective so the global environment outlook report uh, there are two questions that um, I would be asking about you know what are the barriers um, to the effect of enjoyment, particularly of, of science, if we're taking science as a as an inclusive word. Um, so first of all, I would be asking who is in the room when you're deciding what should be in major global assessments such as the GEO? Um, and then secondly, what happens to the information? Where does it go? So if you think about the first question, who is in the room? If you have got um, a very narrow group of people with very specific knowledges in the room, um, it's not always the problem, depends what you're trying to do. But when you're trying to do a global assessment, you do want to have um, diversity of thought, diversity of knowledges. Um, and so you need to make sure that you have those people, um, not just in the room, but with the ability to be having influence of what goes into the report um, from, from the beginning. Um, so that's, that is something we're really, really trying to do. And we're learning all the time about how to do that better. Um, and I think that other major global assessments uh, such as IPBES and IPCC are, are also trying to do the same. Uh, we don't just need that in, in reports like the GEO, we need that in politics, we need that in businesses, we need that in, in all sorts of groups. Um, and something we try and encourage our authors to do and also ourselves on the Secretariat is to um, reflect on, um, on something called positionality. So again, I think this is a term that some people will be very familiar with, for some others it might be new. So positionality really refers to the, the position that you hold in the world. And it's made up of um, all of your, your traits and experiences. So, you know, what kind of training have you had? Where are you from? What language do you speak? Um, what religion are you? Um, all of these things. And you can read a lot about what positionality is. Um, but the reason that it's, I think it's nice to reflect on what your own positionality is, is that there's so much that we take for granted while we move through the world, certain ways of seeing things that we take for granted. Um, and unless we stop and think, okay, well, where has this view come from? then we don't necessarily make room for other views um, because we're just taking our own views, the status quo. Um, so I'd, I'd very much encourage everybody to, um, to reflect on what their positionality might be. There's lots of research papers increasingly so that actually have a positionality statement in them. So they'll say, okay, here's my paper on this topic, but just so you know that the person who's produced this is perhaps, you know, a, a white woman from the UK, which would be part of my profile. Um, and that might mean that I'm bringing a specific um, set of, of experiences to this writing. Um, and then about where does the knowledge go? Um, 
I think that there's some things that you can do to try and make sure that this knowledge is is shared more widely. So you can make sure that your knowledge is translated into different languages. Um, you can make sure that you're speaking to as many different people from across the world as possible. You can make sure that in the case of a report like GEO, you don't just have an online version that you need internet access um, to see it with, but maybe you have a, a, a version you can download or you have paper copies that you can send to people. Um, also, you're making sure that there are images and that you're explaining yourself very clearly so people that don't necessarily come from a scientific background can still read the information and access it. Um, so I think accessibility is something that we're we're really trying to think about as well. And we do notice it in these major global assessments. And um, even from people who are um who are interested in becoming authors, you know, we we really focus on having um gender and geographical balance across all of our chapters within the geo. Um which I think is really, really important. Um, but you definitely see that there are some groups that just have more awareness of these reports and um, so there are more applicants from certain groups so we we do have that balance but we would love to see um more awareness amongst the different groups and um, so that we have more applicants from from all different people from all over the world and um, so i'll stop there and i will hand back to the moderator thank you thank you so much martha again with all the panelists i absolutely agree um, you've all had very thoughtful interventions, and I'm very appreciative of your thoughts and, you know, highlighting different ways that we need to think about you know, the challenges of, you know, related to climate change and, and discussion about the environment and access to science. Um, I think it was all, you know, the, we could have a whole panel based on this first question alone, but I do want to be mindful of time and ensure that all the panelists have, you know, equal, equal amount of time to speak. So we will go on to the second question here. And again, you know, just a reminder, I keep reminding you, I know I'm that annoying host, uh, but if you do have a question, please put it in the chat. We're looking, you know, I'm trying to manage it so that we have ample time for discussion because there's just so much richness here and so much deep expertise from our panelists. Uh, the next question that we have here, and I will post this in the chat for the audience shortly, is one of the things that we frequently encounter is people trying to manipulate science. Right. I'm not talking, you know, you know, when you know your your favorite uh, action movie where there's an evil scientist trying to control the world, uh, or if you've seen the latest Mission Impossible movies where there's an AI trying to control the world. Um, for example, here we see some actors trying to move remove information about deforestation in Brazil on Wikipedia. So we're talking about, you know, in you know, interests in deforestation. So it would be really helpful to hear from the panelists on what steps do you recommend for ensuring that ensuring, excuse me, that science is shared, believed, and used correctly. Um, you know, there's a lot of research out there, but a lot of it goes unknown or gets manipulated, and you know, and, and twisted in various ways. So I would love to hear what the panelists have to say. Um, I will turn to Lisa to start this round of questions. Lisa, over to you. All right, thank you. Yes, this is a very interesting question indeed, because information shared or information put up um, could come from just about anywhere. Anybody could say anything on, uh, on the, online. Um, but I think what's really important to do when we want to provide um, reliable information is that this information come from the communities, that it come from our regions. You know, even um, as an international organization, Inuit Circumpolar Council, we have to ensure that we're passing on the messages from our regions. So we also, ourselves even, need to verify, uh, to make sure that we're being accountable to our communities, that we are actually um, doing what our communities are asking of us and that we're properly representing our communities. So similarly, this is what we would want to see on any type of information that is talking about us, that it is being made with us. So our motto is nothing about us without us. So ensuring that that information is actually coming from our people, from our knowledge holders, from our regions. And then secondly, we continually need to monitor any 
information that is that is made about us and make sure that there's no uh, wrongful information and any information that is misrepresenting us be removed um, as quick as possible and that it be corrected. So I think basically it's it's simple uh, in that way, <laughs> um, in the few words that I can share with you like that. Thanks. Thank you so much, Lisa. And as we all know, unfortunately, it is the simple things that are the most difficult in life. So I appreciate your intervention there. I do want to give a quick shout out and a thank you to all of our interpreters, Anna, Eduardo, Erel, and Jean, who are interpreting in Russian, uh, in Spanish, and in French. So just to acknowledge them. And now we will turn over for the next answer to the question to Martha. Thank you very much. Um, I think Lisa was making an excellent point about um, us all being responsible for trying to monitor um, knowledge as it's produced. Um, I think at GEO, we're quite lucky um, because we're such a, um, a big project and we've got a, an extremely thorough review process for the knowledge that's being produced. So the first stage is to produce it and we do this in iterative drafts. So I think it happens at least three times. We produce the knowledge, it's then reviewed by a set of um, external uh, experts um, with different backgrounds. Um, and if anybody's interested in, in that role, if you sign up to the newsletter on our website, then there's always calls for reviewers that go out. Um, we, so we have the reviewers. We then have another round um, from a group of people called review editors who then read the text, they read the review comments, they read anything that the authors have responded and they look at that whole process to see whether there's any bias um, or any political motivations or or anything like that and that happens as i said multiple times um to try and make sure that we are as scientifically credible uh, as possible um i think it's very important to understand and um i wish it was something that was emphasized um at the beginning of, of everyone's career, particularly people who um, perhaps work in, in sciences and especially Western sciences, uh, that science is not produced and knowledge is not produced in an apolitical vacuum. Um, so people do come with different motivations, um, you know, not always bad motivations, but that that is just the the reality. Um, and I think again, being aware of that and being aware of um maybe multiple interpretations of something allows you to understand um maybe when when something is just a different interpretation versus when somebody is trying to maybe manipulate um the knowledge. So um yeah, I would really echo um Lisa's point as well and just say moderation is is really important. And I think that's something that we can all be doing. We can all be helping moderate knowledge. We can also be making sure that we are not um contributing uh, negatively um to to any knowledge production or removal and um, and and i think yeah i'll stop there i think those are my key points thank you so much martha and absolutely you know thinking about these practical on the ground steps you know something as simple as like workflows on how you know you know and how significant impact they can have on how much knowledge is out there whether it's accurate or not i think it's quite important thank you very much for that and finally, I will um, turn it over to Lisa to round out this round of questions. Lisa, over to you. Yeah, thank you so much, Cameron. And I think maybe I will first um, engage with the first part of your question, you know, manipulating science. Um, unfortunately, in the context of climate change, we do have uh, very real discussions and also scientific experiments about, well, manipulating the planet. Um, we have um, ongoing research and experiments on geoengineering trying to change the natural um, cycles and, and composition of the atmosphere or of the ocean as a way, you know, a technological way to try and mitigate climate change faster and potentially without doing the work on, on reducing um, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we also have a lot of concern about other uh, technologies which are at a speculative stage at this point uh, around other forms of car carbon removal. And I think this is really an important point for, for the question we are looking at, because this is about uh, potentially scientific experiments and advancing science. But in many ways, these experiments 
uh, may already have irreversible negative impacts on the environment and on human rights, including livelihoods, he health and cultural rights. Um, and indigenous peoples representatives um, have been uh, very vocal about this, but you know, many other um, human rights holders and, and civil society have raised this, these concerns. And, and this, I think, points to um, a really deep complexity around thinking about the question of, you know, who's removing information and the point, you know, the earlier point about, you know, um, science based information. Um, uh, there's different, uh, I think, um, powers at play uh, in relation to, you know, which science goes ahead and which science is financed. In some cases, some of this um, let's call it like um, scientific experiments are also a way to open up a whole new business. And more fundamentally, they are what what's often um, are called false solutions. They distract um, energies, resources um, from uh, addressing climate change in terms of reducing our emissions um, and rather hoping that future technological solutions can, can provide a, a, a quick fix or a better fix. And so this is really problematic about how much information is available about the risks of those technologies. In fact, even having access to information about when these technologies are already being tested and where and what kind of impacts they may have and on whom. And more broadly, there's a question around, you know, who's spreading the information? Is there proactive misinformation and is there greenwashing as well um, in this realm? So I think these are all very deep challenges. And again, having um, an understanding or having access to different knowledge holders who can help navigate that, I think is a huge um, challenge. I mean, I, I don't know if this has already come up in the uh, wiki communities conversation, but in a way it's really quite maybe the biggest challenge in terms of thinking about the human right to science and its dimensions of making sure it benefits everyone without discrimination. Uh, both in research endeavors and in participating in research, uh, protecting the environment and human rights from scientific research that may be harmful, and also thinking about setting priorities for research that really um, benefit the most vulnerable, as opposed to maybe uh, allowing research funding and efforts going into you know, potentially false solutions or solutions that may benefit few, uh, but have very high risks, if not proven, negative impacts on uh, either particular groups and communities or uh, very vulnerable individuals in our, um, in, in, you know, across humanity, including across generations. So yeah, I'm, I'm bringing quite a few problematic elements there, but I think, you know, having this conversation uh, is really important. Thank you again for that answer. Uh, you know, this, you know, th this answer really is highlighting how complex this entire area it, it is. It's not so simple as just discussing, you know, oh, the right to access science and leave it there. Like we just publish it and it's done. There's a lot of different actors at play. There's different, you know, motivations that are out there um, that make the entire, you know, element of science communication. I think, you know, and dissemination of information extraordinarily challenging. Um, We'll go over to turn over to the last question now. We're soon getting to our discussion with panelists and speakers. Um, I did want to mention that that Mohammed Amin is has joined us. For those of you who were not aware, uh, and we're here to able to answer your questions about the, the Maghreb presentation that you saw earlier. Uh, so on to the last question, Mohammed. I'm glad you can make it. Um, the last question that we have for our panelists is: What do you need from digital public infrastructure like Wikipedia? to do to ensure that these global conversations about access to the benefits of science are able to reach the public. So this, I think, dovetails quite nicely with the last uh, answer that we received. And I will turn this over to Martha to answer first. Martha, over to you. And I'll post a question in the chat. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I think there's there's a few things um, that would be great to see or that are already great to see. So I think on one side, we've got almost the safeguarding element uh, that we were starting to touch on in the last question, you know, so are places like Wikipedia or Wikimedia, are they, are they safe for people to be um, to be using? Do they have the correct knowledge um, and, and all of those kind of points? Um, I think if we take it that 
that it is um, a user-friendly and safe environment to be to be using in a trustworthy source. And then the question is, you know, what kind of information is on there? So just again, in terms of the geo as an example, um, it's a major global assessment. It would be great to see um, a Wikipedia mention of it so that people can then go and see Wikipedia, which is somewhere that people use a lot, um, and then have access to this um, to this report that they might not have heard of. And um, so there's also a bit of a, a sort of publicity role. Um, I think to support that, uh, then, then there's all sorts of questions that we can get into about well how does um a public resource like wikipedia do that i think you know they can ask for donations which they often do and um, i think events like this um help everybody think about what a valuable resource it is and what we can all be doing to um to uphold and and maintain it as well um so yeah so i think those are the two elements there's one making sure that it that it is a great resource um, in terms of safety and then also is thinking okay well what do we have in that resource and is it as, as relevant as it can be for everybody um thank you wonderful thank you so much uh, martha for that answer there uh, absolutely this you know this kind this kind of event again is, is, a, is a great example of what can be done in the positive sense and you know again to our attendees this is an exceptional opportunity to have such deep expertise and knowledge in this topic right here I'm blows my mind so please feel free to put questions into the chat I will turn now over to Elisa to answer this question Elisa over to you yeah, thank you so much I mean um of course there, there's maybe two things that come to mind the first is, Going back to what we discussed earlier, if it is possible for, um, you know, the wiki communities and others to try and engage with multiple sources of knowledge on a certain issue and definitely working across um, natural and social sciences and also engaging with indigenous knowledge with all the um, respectful procedures that Lisa also explained. But I think usually when you bring different sources of knowledge on a certain issue, you realize when there are tensions or um, problems that might not be visible just from one viewpoint. And the second point, I think it's um, it's just to integrate, if possible, information from the work that the UN Special Rapporteurs are doing uh, on the human right to a healthy environment, uh, not just myself, but, you know, Lisa mentioned, I think, a, a really incredible report, the UN Special Rapporteur on Toxics Produced on the Life Cycle of plastics. And that gives an example of how by looking at different areas of knowledge, uh, but also the lived experience of different human rights holders, it was possible to identify many, uh, I think, exactly false solutions and misperceptions of the problems, its origins, and their responsibilities to really effectively address the global plastic crisis. And, and you know, the work also of the UN Special Rapporteur, on the human right to a healthy environment, all those materials, as well as reports that the colleagues at the UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights produce, really do also themselves that engagement with different sources of knowledge and engagement with different um, human rights holders and knowledge holders, um, and can provide a, um, a helpful source to navigate the other information that is available out there, and at least be alerted where uh, there may be risks of misinformation or disinformation or misrepresentation. I think that was another point that Lisa mentioned. Thank you very much uh, for the thoughtful answer. And, you know, again, you know, it's really, you know, the wiki community being so globally diverse, you know, and, you know, speaking so many different languages, you know, provides a lot of opportunities, you know, for engage, critical engagement with this, you know, ch the challenges around this area. And last, but certainly not least, we'll turn it over to Lisa to provide the next answer for the question. Lisa, over to you. Yes, thanks again for this very interesting conversation. I'm really appreciating the things that I'm hearing. So in terms of what we need from Wikipedia. First of all, I'd like to say a big thank you um, for you know making information freely available and always doing your best to ensure that it is accurate and correct. We and I rely on often on Wikipedia information and find it so useful. Um, what would be good is to see more recognition and emphasis of indigenous knowledge um, on, on, on Wikipedia. And 
seeing recognition and emphasis of indig indigenous knowledge. So that way it would show that there's not only one type of knowledge out there to the readers, but that indigenous knowledge as another form of knowledge is of great value in and of itself, and that it, it doesn't require Western science to validate it. Um, and that also science has its limits as well, any kind of science, but Western science too. You know, our world is not in a, in a, in a very good state right now. And it's partly science that has brought us to this point. So not recognizing the limits of siloed knowledge in the real world is, is a challenge. So, for example, the discovery of pesticides and its long lasting effects on the environment were, were not understood. And it came to a point that the mass use of herbicides was, um, was really damaging the environment, nearly bringing some bird species to extinction even. So it was not regulated for so long. But, you know, the reverse of that, that harm uh, is nearly uh, not doable. It, it, it's really very difficult to reverse that harm. So, Nevertheless, we still continue to pollute and poison our environment, even though we know that it is very harmful too. So um, if we keep believing that we can just go on, that scientific knowledge will get us out of there eventually, well, I think it's, it's very difficult to, to believe that. But we have enough best available knowledge to recognize that we need to change our ways. So it's just a matter of acting. The other thing that I would like to say about um, uh, information sharing through Wikipedia is that, you know, our way of transmitting knowledge as Inuit especially um, is through observation and not just through reading texts or, you know, sitting down at, at a school environment for us a transmission of knowledge often occurs out on the land in the environment that we grow up in we have learned by observation and so as a way to to uh, bring people to to sharing knowledge a good way would be to use videos to show people about the environment for example and so being out on the land, on the water, where we can connect to plants and to animals that surround us and where we depend on them, I think is one of the ways that would be wonderful to see more and more on Wikipedia so that we don't touch, uh, we don't lose touch with the, the real world around us. Our sila, our exterior is what we call it. So thank you for this opportunity to share once again. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, well said, excellently said, you know, and important to highlight, you know, th that there are different ways of knowing, right? And there's, there's ways of knowing that are not just extractive, even science has a type of an extractive nature to it, also from the natural environment, but also ways that the natural environment can give us wisdom, right? Wisdom and how to be. But, uh, reminded, and before we go over to the Q&A, I want to thank all of our panelists again for your thoughtful answers. And we have some questions for all of you from our, our audience. And just, uh, you know, to add on to Lisa's point, my grandfather had a tribal background in Iran. And so my father was raised with a lot of some traditional knowledge on healing techniques and I, nothing scientific. And I remember uh, several years ago, my fiance had a medical situation that was occurring late at night. And I used some of that knowledge, which is not scientific, and it did help her and cure her of the problem. So we avoided a hospital visit. There are many different ways of knowing and learning. And I'm grateful for that kind of wisdom that came from a non-traditional method. So just want to add on to what Lisa, to a non-scientific method rather, what Lisa said. So thank you again to all the panelists. And we will go over to some questions that we have from the audience. And again, I'm sure you're 100% tired of me saying it. I'm tired of saying it. Uh, but you should post the questions in the chat. 
uh, but we'll get started with the questions that we have. And I, um, out of respect for the privacy of the uh, attendees, I will not name the, you know, list the name of the person who's asked a question. If the person wishes to be acknowledged, please, by all means, put that in the chat, uh, since it's not clear. This question is for both Lisa and Martha. And Lisa, since your video is on, we'll go to you first. Um, I will paste the question also in the chat. Uh, while the Inuit will most definitely have unique challenges, they are commonalities with other indigenous communities around the world. Is there any kind of collaboration with other indigenous communities on the decolonization of science? It's a great question. And uh, I'll read it one more time just to be sure. I put the question in the chat. While the Inuit most definitely have unique challenges, there are other common there are commonalities with other indigenous communities. Is there any kind of collaboration with other indigenous communities on the decolonization of science? Lisa, since your video is up, I'll turn it over to you and then also to Martha. Well, first of all, thank you for the question, um, which is really relevant for us as Inuit. And um, yes, we do. Uh, collaborate with other indigenous peoples, um, especially in the climate change area, in the conference of parties, where we participate um, annually every year uh, for, uh, you know, um, raising awareness to our priorities and the importance of including indigenous knowledge uh, as a knowledge of, with its value of its own and equal to all other knowledges. So, you know, um, the Sami, uh, who are uh, the indigenous peoples of, of in, either within the Scandinavian countries are also an Arctic peoples. So we indeed collaborate closely with them um, in terms of climate change and climate action. And so, um, there are many other Indigenous peoples that we do collaborate with in, within Indigenous peoples caucuses of the important um, international arenas like the COPs of climate change under the U, UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. Um, sometimes we stand alone in other international arenas, for example, at the International Maritime Organization but wherever there is opportunity, uh, we know that there is greater strength in collaborating with uh, other indigenous peoples. So climate change, climate action is an important area where we do collaboration work. Yes, thank you for the question. Thank you, Lisa. And Martha, the question was also addressed to you. Great question. So thank you very much for asking it. Um, definitely. So I think, again, I keep speaking about geo, but it's what I know. So um, hopefully you can bear with me on that as an example. Um, with this task force that I was talking about earlier, this um, Indigenous Knowledge and Local Knowledge Task Force, it is made up of um, Indigenous knowledge holders from all around the world. So from all of the, the five recognised UN regions. Um, and people come together um, often online, but sometimes in, in person um, to, to discuss how they want to be working as a task force. Um, I think what's really interesting about this group as well, and I've learned so, so much, um, is just how, you know, different people will speak about Indigenous knowledge and indigenous holding Indigenous knowledge and Indigenous peoples in different ways, depending on where you're from. So I think that's why it's been really important to have representation um, from across these different regions. And um, we also try and be inclusive um, as far as possible, though, of course, it's it's difficult to be as inclusive as we might always want to be. And um, so, for example, we held our, our first dialogue where we didn't just have this task force, but we opened it up more widely and had even more participants um, involved in an online dialogue that was held in English. Uh, we held it at two different times of the day to try and make it accessible to different um, different communities. Um, we're now in the middle of our, our second dialogue, um, which is being held in a different way. It's in person, it's in Mexico, and it's being held in Spanish. Spanish. Um, so again, we're, the, the fact that we're hosting several of these in different places and different languages um, 
we do try and make it um, more inclusive and more accessible. And of course, there are always ways that we can improve. And um, the people that are involved will be the people that have uh, heard about us and, um, you know, have the accessibility to be able to apply to be um, part of the dialogues. Um, and we really do try and make sure that it is advertised as widely as possible in as many different ways through as many communities. But um, we are always learning and improving. Um, in addition to that, the, the UNEP itself also has an Indigenous Peoples Working Group. Um, so like Lisa was just mentioning, um, through the COPS, uh, through UNEA, which is the UN Environment Assembly, which happens every two years in Nairobi as well, um, we do um, engage with different groups. Um, again, I'm, I'm hoping that everybody that is engaging is always open to learning and improving. Um, but I think that we have luckily seen um, much better efforts to be um, more inclusive of different knowledges. And I hope that this only gets better and better. Thank you, Martha. And it looks like Lisa has a follow-up. <laughs> yes, I do. Thank you so much. And dialogues reminded me, as I was speaking about the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, I had wanted to mention, you know, uh, we have a platform in 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 that uh, convention on climate change, which is the local communities and indigenous peoples platform. And through that, we have organized an Arctic regional gathering, uh, a first one um, that happened last fall. So in that, there were Sami. There were uh, Athabascans, there were uh, Aleut from the Aleutian Islands off of Alaska, the Quichin, and um, uh, some indigenous peoples from Chukotka, Russia also, that where we shared our knowledges through there and uh, spoke and reflected together on how we bring our knowledge to climate work. Then there's also the Arctic Council, where we are permanent participants, along with other Indigenous Peoples organizations. The Arctic Council has working groups where, you know, we push for the inclusion of our knowledge. Uh, it, there have been challenges there. As a group of Indigenous Peoples, um, we are six Indigenous Peoples organizations who participate in, you know, priority areas. Uh, of research. Um, and so uh, some challenges have been in the co-production of knowledge, for example. But when it comes to assessment and, and monitoring um, program uh, of the Arctic Council, there we can push for co-production of knowledge. So yeah, there's been <laughs> quite a lot of collaborative work there too. Thank you. Thank you so much for the follow-up. Uh, we'll go over to the next question. Ah, it looks like Martha has a response. This is great. This is how panels are supposed to work. So <laughs> Martha, Sorry, over to I, you. <laughs> I, won't, I won't take up too much time because I'm sure there are other questions as well. Just very quickly, one point I wanted to make, um, because I think this is such an important question, was specifically about the decolonization point um, of science. So this question was um, specifically talking about um, the role of Indigenous communities um, in this decolonization work. Um, I would just add to that, I think it's also really important that even if you don't identify as being from an Indigenous community, um, that you take time to understand what decolonization means, what the movements are, why it might be important, where it's come from. Um, you know, I was trained as a natural science scientist originally, um, and I absolutely loved my degree. I, I think it was an excellent degree. We learned all about the scientific method, about its strengths and its weaknesses, and I think that was really important. And um, it wasn't until my master's level um, and I specifically chose that master's um, to be, it was a critical social science master's um, where we we did think about, okay, what not just what is the scientific method, but what is the history of it? Where has it come from? What power has been associated with the dissemination of knowledge about the scientific method? Um, and it was one of the, um, the best courses that I've ever done. So I think, um, you know, I don't personally identify as somebody from an indigenous community, um, but I, do try and continue to try and um, do the work that I can do um, to to understand um, decolonization as well. Um, so I think that's something for everybody to consider. 
Thank you, Martha. Uh, well said uh, to, to both of our panelists and this wonderful question. There is a, another question that we will get to just to respect our audience's uh, engagement here. Um, really thoughtful answer. Boy, what a great, what a great session. What a great event. Um, this one, this question, I will again post it into the chat, uh, but I will read it now. What is being done uh, regarding indigenous people and knowledge in the Caribbean regarding this project and climate change? And how can we, and by we, I'm assuming the Wikimedia community, help share or get involved? Uh, I'll read it one more time. What is being done regarding indigenous people and knowledge in the Caribbean regarding this project and climate change? And how can we help share or get involved? And this is not addressed to any one uh, panelist, so I open it to all of our panelists and our speakers from earlier. And we'll post a question in the chat if anybody has any thoughts about this. And then just, you know, one of the things that the, the challenges as we often see is, is some of some regions of the world are often excluded from the conversation and the Caribbean is one of them that we don't often hear about climate change and the Caribbean. So if anybody has any thoughts from our panelists or speakers, uh, that would be great. Aliza, wonderful. We'll start with you. Yeah, I mean, it might not be a, a full answer, but I think something I, I and, and colleagues from the Caribbean and Latin American, uh, America observed was recently, you, you may be aware, the Inter-American Court for Human Rights has been asked to provide an advisory opinion on human rights and climate change. Uh, and that will be an opinion that is relevant for the whole region. In fact, I think it will have in a lot of relevance for, for the whole world. But what was interesting is that the court decided to have a, a public hearing in Barbados and then another public hearing, well, two public hearings in Brazil. And the idea was really that of reaching out to communities and human rights holders um, in the two, let's say, sub-regions. And what was cl quite clear at those hearings is how even within that region for um, language reasons and also traditions of co cooperation and collaboration, uh, the Caribbean and, and the broader Latin American region are not quite aware of um, one another's issues and indigenous knowledge and how that is contributing to climate change, but also how it's been negatively impacted by climate change. Um, so there may be something there, I think, about that creating new bridges, including through, I think, addressing language barriers, but not only to really support the both the learning around the Caribbean region, but also connecting um, efforts and knowledge co-production um, across the broader Latin, Latin, Latin American and Caribbean region. And through that, also allowing um, the rest of the world to kind of to learn and make sure those views and uh, concerns and areas of knowledge are, are integrated. Uh, so just a, some reflections, not quite the answer. Uh, but maybe uh, uh, some considerations to keep in mind. Wonderful. Thank you. It's good to hear that. Uh, thank you for those reflections. Um, does anybody, any of our other panelists or speakers have any follow-up? If not, we can go to the next question. I don't want to put anybody on the spot. I love these kind of questions that are, you know, very niche that we actually have to really wrestle with, you know, and we could, you know, think about this question you know, about a lot of other areas of, have, for example, low populations, you know, which are nonetheless, you know, human beings and, you know, climate change is important and access to science, uh, benefits from science, they're also important. So these are, you know, one of the themes has been representation here. So this is a great question regarding representation. I will go over to the uh, next question that we have here and post it in the chat in a moment. This question is for Mohammed, who thankfully was able to join us. Uh, we did show your video, unfortunately, uh, because you were not here, but this question is for you. Uh, it's regarding the Magra, uh, Magra presentation. The question says, I want to learn more about the campaign and the individual would like to have a link for the campaign. So maybe if there's anything else in the video, Mohammed, that was not discussed, or if you would like to just maybe talk about some highlights, again, uh, that would be appreciated for this audience member. And I will post a question in the chat. Can you hear me? Yes, a little, the volume's a little low, but I can hear you. Okay, I will try. How about now? Perfect. Great. Okay. Uh, firstly, thank you for having me here, and uh, apologize because I have been I have issue with uh, the internet. So back to the question, uh, the Maghreb region uh, uh, is uh, first Wikimedia collaborating in the region that we use the Wikimedia project for highlighting uh, uh, climate change issue in the region, and that through uh, organizing contests, uh, events. 
uh, also training for uh, Wikimedia, uh, Wikimedian uh, members as well, for uh, new people who want to be uh, involved in contributing in highlighting uh, climate change issue and uh, uh, working to knowledge for a sustainable future in the region. Also, we focus so much in a lower presented uh, language community such as Tamazigh, Tashilhi, Darja, Qbail, all the uh, all this uh, lower present language. So, with that, in collaboration with uh, uh, academics research as well for also artists, uh, making all together to make sure everyone in the region has access for based uh, fact scientific uh, information. Uh, to for uh, for facing uh, environmental challenges in, in the region, I will put the link of uh, our meta page in 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 the chat. So please feel free to take a look and learn more about campaign the Maghreb region. And please feel free to reach out if you have a question uh, or uh, a suggestion on cooperation in the future. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you and. Uh... Great. Uh, there is a the link was posted. Actually, it was posted to the contributor channel. But let me repost this here um, for you all to see. Wonderful. Um, I do see we do not have any further questions. So maybe I can ask if any of the uh, panelists who and speakers who were not uh, directly, you know, asked by our volunteers, uh, if they have any questions, if they would like to add to any of the questions that were shared. Um, if not, we can perhaps open the floor if anybody has any final reflections to or final thoughts they would like to add. And again, I encourage the audience in the last few minutes here to add any last minute questions. Wonderful. Well, I'll you know sort of summarize things then. <clears throat> And we'll see if there's any last minute questions come in from the audience. But first of all, I want to thank all of our, you know, I want to thank all of our attendees uh, for taking time out of the day to come to this important panel. Um, I've been beyond inspired. You know, it's a good panel when the host is sitting taking notes and like, ah, oh, now I have to go talk. I'm just so engaged. Uh, but I want to thank all of our attendees who, who took time to join, to come and, and, you know, and sit here with us and listen and ask questions. It was really great to have everybody here. I'd like to thank our speakers and panelists for also taking time out of your day um, and sharing your deep wisdom and deep expertise here with all of us on this really important question. You know, global challenges are, are really, you know, addressed and solved at these small local levels with these small groups sitting here and talking together. So, I, you know, I'm really appreciative to all of you. This has been, to me, an absolutely fascinating webinar, one of the best I've attended be honest with you, uh, the, the insights, the wisdom was really touching to me and very inspiring. I'm so alive with it. Um, if there's any, if, if any of the panelists have any or speakers have anything final to say, uh, please speak up now. Otherwise, we will be able to end this event slightly earlier than anticipated. Okay. Well, thank you again to everybody. Thank you to our staff at the Wikimedia side uh, you know, on, on the handling of the logistics and the emails, the gazillion emails back and forth and all the back channel conversations to make this event happen. To all of our translators, you know, uh, a special warm spot in my heart for uh, our interns who are translating here. Uh, really appreciate all of you, in the uh, translators, but especially my interns here. Uh, thank you for taking time out of your, your, your busy school time to come and translate for this event. And yes, as Alex says in the chat, we will be publishing a recording of this excellent call next week, and we will be sure to publish this so people can you know, really partake in the wonderful, rich conversation here and the deep wisdom and expertise of all of our speakers and panelists. Thank you again so much, everybody. Take care. I wish you all the best. And hopefully together we will you know, be able to make you know, progress on climate change and ensuring that we have a healthy, holistic, and happy environment for all of us. Thank you again. Take care. Bye-bye.